for it's a trepid. Sorry. Uh, okay. It is a trepidant and motley multitude. Uh, two interesting words here. Trepidant means trembling with fear. Trembling with fear. And motley, that means sort of having elements of great variety or incongruity. So we have a a multitude that's trembling with fear and it's a great variety or incongruity heterogeneous mixture of beings a strange pell-mell of magic artisans pell-mell here is a, a confused mixture something that is a headlong frantic disorderly haste and artisans, of course, are craftspeople. So Sri Aurobindo is using a lot of interesting words here. A strange pell-mell of magic artisans. Well, why are they magic? Because they have this possibility to mold the plastic clay of life. A strange pell-mell of magic artisans was seen molding the plastic clay of life. And what are they? An elfin brood, an elemental kind. Elfin, of course, is usually we understand it as small, man-like beings that are mischievous. They certainly are mischievous. Brood is um, offspring, one family, species, a group. Uh, elemental kind, very primitive, very simple. So now we come to this astonished by the unaccustomed glow, as if imminent in the shadows, started up imps with wry limbs and carved beast visages, sprite prompters, goblin wizened or fairy small and genii fairer but unsold and poor and fallen beings their heavenly portion lost and errant divinities trapped in time's dust a lot to go through here oh we see that this elfin brood, this elemental kind, uh, is astonished by this unaccustomed glow, this, this light that Ashwapati is bringing. As if imminent in the shadows, these imps started up. Started up, of course, began with wry limbs. Wry, wry is um, often we say he had a wry look that is twisted into an expression of disgust or disappointment or annoyance. So imps with wry limbs, these are limbs that are twisted into these expressions and carved beast visages. Visages are appearances, aspects. Now he's going to get, you see, he's already told us elfin brood. He's told us about imps. And now he's going to talk to us about some other things, some sprite prompters, goblin wizened or fairy small. Uh, sprite prompters, he hyphenates the word here, and, and they are elves or fairies or even goblins, but they incite and they often move others against their own will. Goblin. Goblin is, again, a grotesque sprite that is mischievous or malicious towards people. 
Now, he says goblin wizened. Oh, we speak of someone who is wizened with age. The face is wrinkled and the body is, it looks a bit frail. Wizened, shriveled, shriveled, or wrinkled with age. So these sprite prompters, goblin wizened, goblin wizened, or very small, so they can be elves, they can be fairies, they can be goblins, they can be types of sprites, very small, like a fairy. And it's a class of supernatural beings. They're generally considered as having a diminutive human form, but they possess magical powers. And they also intervene in human affairs. Now he's going to talk about genii, fairer, but unsold and poor. Genii is from the Arab jinn, or D-J-I-N, or J-I-N-N. -N. And that is a collective class of spirits. Some are good, some are evil. And Many are supposed to interfere powerfully in human affairs. So we have all of these things that Sri Aurobindo gives us. And now this shocking thing. And fallen beings, their heavenly portion lost. And errant divinities trapped in time's dust. This is, these are the ones who have gone against the will of God. They're fallen beings. They may even be errant divinities, divinities who strayed from the proper course or the proper standards, and therefore they're trapped in time's dust. ignorant and dangerous wills, but armed with power, half animal, half God, their mood, their shape. Out of the grayness of a dim background, their whispers come, an inarticulate force, awake in mind, an echoing thought or word, to their sting of impulse, the heart's sanction draw. And in that little nature, do their work. And fill its powers and creatures with unease. Now, I think all of us, well, maybe not all of us, but many of us have said things allowed things to come out of our, our mouths that we didn't mean. Uh, and these beings are the one who, ones who do this. They are not us. In fact, we think all these things are us, our thoughts and our wisdom and all, nothing at all. It's all nature. And so we see that Out of the grayness of a dim background, their whispers come, an inarticulate force, uh, not uttered or emitted with expressive or intelligible mod modulations, we would say, but they awake in mind an echoing thought or word. And then he says, to their sting of impulse, the heart's sanction draw. So they even draw the heart sanction, agreement, authoritative permission or approval to their sting of impulse. And in that little nature, do their work. And do what? And fill its powers and creatures 
with unease. And now he's going to take us even deeper. Because we have to know that these planes of existence actually exist. And Sri Aurobindo is the one who has studied them, climbed up this stair, and found out their good and their weak points. So we see next, it's seed of joy. There is a seed of joy in all of us. And they curse it with sorrow's fruit. They put out with error's breath its scanty lights and turn its surface truths to falsehood's ends. Its small emotions spur, its passions drive to the abyss or through the bog and mire or else with a goad of hard, dry lusts they prick, while jogs on devious ways that nowhere lead life's cart, finding no issue from ignorance. A lot to go through here. So these beings who approach us when we are weak or when we are open, and we see that constantly in these homes for the insane, the deeply troubled, and they sting the heart sanction. They draw it with a sting of impulse, and they do their little work. It's not a huge work, but for some people, it's life-changing towards the negative. And they fill its powers and creatures with unease. Then he tells us now, it's seed of joy, life's seed of joy. They curse with sorrow's fruit. Put out with error's breath, it's scanty lights the scanty lights of joy and turn its surface truths to falsehood's ends. Its small emotions spur, its passions drive to the abyss or through the bog and mire. I have felt anger in myself when I knew it was not my anger. And I was livid with anger at times toward myself or toward things or toward circumstances. And I was used by these beings. I tell you honestly, this is my experience. Then he has a, he has a colon after the word Meyer. And he says, or else with a goad. A goad is a long stick. You know, the, the little boys prod, prod their goats and their cows with a goad. And to prick something is to urge it on, to spur it. Or else with a goad of hard, dry lusts, they prick. While jogs on devious ways that nowhere lead life's cart finding no issue from ignorance, no result from ignorance, jogs on, pushing on, nudging on, moving with a jolting rhythm, bumping, jerking. Now, to sport with good and evil is their law. So they have a law these gods of this plane, of the little life, these godheads. They lure, lure to failure, luring to failure and meaningless success. Oh, what a line. Huh? Luring to failure 
and meaningless success, all models they corrupt, all measures cheat, make knowledge a poison, virtue a pattern dull, and lead the endless cycles of desire through semblances of sad or happy chance, what did they lead it to? To an inescapable fatality. They sport, they sport. It's their recreation, it's their play, it's their frolic, it's their pastime. They sport with good and evil. Because that's their law. That's what they do at this realm. And they even lure to failure and meaningless success. They corrupt all models. They cheat all measures. They make knowledge a poison. And they make virtue a dull pattern. And lead the endless cycles of desire through semblances, appearances, likenesses of sad or happy chance to an inescapable fatality. Oh, I don't know if we should go on. This is, this is so difficult, but we must know that these beings exist. And they do have purchase in, in our lives. They can enter our beings when we are unaware. Mother speaks about them at great length. She knew the occult like no one else knew it. So I think what I'm going to do is ask if you have any questions. And if not, I will read it through. I have a question, Naraji. Yes. This is amazing because I have, like you said about your own experience with anger, I have lived it and I'm learning it for the first time in my life. Can you speak a little louder? I can't hear you, Falgo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hear Can you hear me now? Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for reading this. this is, I have experienced this uh, through myself or through others. And my question is, uh, how do we protect ourselves? Ah, it's a very good question. Huh? How do we protect ourselves? The only way I know is by constantly calling mother. And today I was with Vasanti and Jayanti for hours. And Jayanti spoke about these beings and how mother would protect her every time she called. She said every time, not one time, did mother not help her. She helped her every time. So that mm. japa of the name is so important in mm. our evolutionary progress, in the work of our inner being. In the, in the bringing forward of the psychic presence in us. It yeah, is you. only through mother that we can make this great progress. Thank you. Is Japa enough or does it, does it have to be, is there, is, is the intention or something behind it that really matters more? Uh, I will answer your question. When one begins japa, it is very often simply mechanical. Yes. Ma, ma, mother, mother, and one repeats it and repeats it. But after some time, the soul catches it, and it begins to repeat it consciously. And there is nothing greater than that. To answer your question, so uh, so if we if we are in the middle of a work, I've experienced these from people around me when I'm in the middle of work, any any work. Uh, sometimes I can chant uh, japa, 
but so there are times when I cannot. Uh, during those times, uh, what is the best uh, option? Like practical. Well, Buddha, Buddha said, build a wall. Okay. You okay. Build a wall between them and you, and everything they say goes back on them. Yeah, I've experienced that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, I will. Uh, I will begin reading. <clears throat> a trepidant and motley multitude. A strange pell-mell of magic artisans. Look at the music here. Motley multitude, magic, mel. Oh, the alliteration is so beautiful. We should sometimes talk more about the mantra in Savitri, the music in Savitri. But let's leave that for another time. And I'll read down. A trepidant and motley multitude, a strange pell-mell of magic artisans, was seen molding the plastic clay of life. An elfin brood, an elemental kind, astonished by the unaccustomed glow, as if imminent in the shadows started up imps with wry limbs and carved beast visages. Sprite prompters, goblin wizened, or fairy small. And genii, fairer but unsold and poor. And fallen beings their heavenly portion lost, and errant divinities trapped in time's dust. Ignorant and dangerous wills, but armed with power, half animal, half god, their mood, their shape. Out of the grayness of a dim background, their whispers come, an inarticulate force. Awaken mind, an echoing thought or word. Do their sting of impulse, the heart's sanction, draw. And in that little nature, do their work. And fill its powers and creatures with unease. Its seed of joy, they curse with sorrow's fruit. Put out with error's breath its scanty lights. And turn its surface truths to falsehood's ends. Its small emotions spur. Its passions drive to the abyss or through the bog and mire, or else with a goad of hard, dry lusts they prick, while jogs on devious ways that nowhere lead life's cart, finding no issue from ignorance. To sport with good and evil is their law, luring to failure and meaningless success. All models they corrupt, all measures cheat, make knowledge a poison, virtue a pattern dull, and lead the endless cycles of desire through semblances of sad or happy chance to an inescapable fatality. Any final questions? Any thoughts, Vladimir? <laughs> well, <clears throat> one thought comes to mind that these are the powers of nature reached by this fighting and uh, 
leading to fatality are actually providing um, the space for new creation, for new interference of the divine, for new powers to enter and to make new order. They don't, uh, that's why they are permitted to work, because they are helping <clears throat> to clear up the space. We cannot just pile up <clears throat> good things. We need to introduce more and more new powers of the divine. And for that, they work also for the divine, these powers. Well, this is, of course, the uh, what the Asura does. Right. And why he is permitted to do his work. And he's permitted. And mother <laughs> says, but they are also my children. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the Asura is also mother's children because it does goad us. It goads us perhaps into doing right at times when we see that we are doing wrong. Right. But uh, this is not, um, what shall I say, uh, a beautiful passage that we've just been through. All of these elves and fairies and sprites and goblins are, they're not huge, they're not asuric, but they are destructive if we could allow we, them to. Could we put them under the term of pishachas? I would say so, yes, definitely. Are yes. are they are they Buddhas like uh, Sri Aurobindo talks about in some of his letters on yoga? He talks about, uh, for for example, in a letter he talks about, you know, sometimes you see a pen falling, and he says, "Do you think it just fell on its own? There was a there was a Buddha, or a kind of an elven spirit, an, an elf uh, that." was actually goading the pen to fall or for a, a simple thing to fall from the table, etc. But you, and, you know, you know, these this. things are, of course, they are possible. <clears throat> but I think what this passage has to tell us is don't go there. We are don't already go. there, yes. <laughs> don't go there. We are already <laughs> fully there. <laughs> Among oh, them. Yes. Um, my, positive, my positive friend Vladimir. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying about uh, anger today, and I was thinking, well, I I was thinking about myself. Am I so stupid, really, that I can be angry with something physical like a gust of wind, or you know, or the splash of uh, water? Is it really possible to be angry with? <laughs> and then when you said this today, I thought, now I understand. <laughs> you can be angry with anything. <clears throat> because With anything. Forces... You drop a piece of paper and you right. say, why did I drop that paper? And then you curse the paper. Yes. What? <laughs> what did the paper do? <laughs> paper didn't do anything, but you let it drop. <laughs> okay. Exactly. All right. Oh, you oh, say to yourself, you, oh, you say to nature, not now, please, not now, not again. <laughs> to whom do you say not again? <clears throat> very true, very true. Yes. So can I, it's beautiful. Can, can, yeah. can I speak to you, Naraji, for five minutes? Or is it okay? Uh, no, not tonight. I'm, okay. I'm a bit tired tonight, but another I'll, time, sure. I will email you, sure. Okay, very good. Okay, namaste. 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 Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Thank you. Namaste.